Insightful Podcasts by Informative Hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment. This is episode 120. Happy birthday and beyond. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my loving and supportive co-host, Michelle Whalen. Hello, my love. How are you doing today, sweetheart? I am just wonderful. How are you? I am frustrated, angry, <laughs> irate, and a few other adjectives that I can't say on this podcast. Mm. But that's not what we're talking about today. No, it's no, not? No, no. Okay. Because there's, there's a lot of things that are setting me <laughs> off today. So I'm trying to trying to calm down and, and be the happier. Version of yourself that everybody loves. Exactly. Everybody loves me. <laughs> everybody. It's everybody. that ogre everybody loves. Mm-hmm. So today, in our Disney detective, a happy birthday wish to my favorite celebrity. You're such a kiss <laughs> And news of a film she's appearing in. And details are released of the new late year movie. Now, f- just for the record, I didn't even realize it was her birthday until I saw it on Twitter today. Right. So, and then I happened to read over the show notes and saw that she was going to be in the movie that we're going to be talking about. Right. So I had to wish her a happy birthday on the show. So we'll we'll do that when we get to the okay. that part of the show. Mm-hmm. Then in our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy, <laughs> someone besides me has cheeky responses to Disney's obscene prices for the Galactic Star Cruiser experience. Go figure. Plus, Disney is looking for an actress to play the live-action version of Sabine Wren. Very exciting. Mm-hmm. And for our entertainment news, a favorite canceled NBC series is close to returning. And then Wizard World sells out to Fan Expo. And, as always, we'll finish up with our insightful picks of the week. Another one that I stole from you, conveniently enough. I'm so glad I'm I'm there for you. It just goes to show you how culturally enriched you are that you're supplying See? so many good sources for me. <laughs> I'm so glad. And then we obviously have some afterthoughts we're still talking about. Mm-hmm. So that's the show. Are we ready to get started? Sure. All right. Before we get into it, though, I do want to... Uh, I don't know, implore, beg, plead. Please How desperate love us. do I want to sound today? <laughs> uh, Please sub- subscribe. Subscribe to uh, our Comment something. Podcast. Let us know you're listening. You can get audio versions of this podcast listed as Insights and Entertainment. Uh, video versions, we're, we're kind of going through a transition right now. And right. Kind of a programming note. Uh, We currently host our video versions of the podcast on Castos. And I got notification from Castos that they decided that they were going to double our monthly cost to host with them for no really good reason. So I'm in the process of we already have a new hosting provider. We're going to be moving our stuff over to there. I don't know what effect it's going to have on on the video podcast. Uh, during this transition, I'm hoping to be as smooth as possible, but nothing's ever smooth for me when I do <laughs> these things. So it's going to be a complete disaster. Right. If you need, if you really want to watch the video version of the podcast, they are still posted up on uh, YouTube to watch as well. And we do stream reruns of the shows all week long. So anyway, if you do want to look at the video, look up the video version of the podcast and subscribe to it. That one's listed as insights into things, and it's going to affect all of our shows. Beyond that, we do ask you to give us some feedback. Tell us what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong. Uh, Give us some suggestions on expos and conventions and stuff like that that we can talk about Mm -hmm. because we're talking about all regional stuff close to us. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would love to talk about stuff around the country, around the world. Mm -hmm. So you can email that over to comments at insightsintothings.com. You can get us on Twitter at insights underscore things. 
Uh, we're on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast on Instagram. We're at insights into things, or you can get links to all those on our site at insights into things.com. Okay. That's half the show right there. Uh, Thank we, you. Good night. <laughs> thanks have, for joining us tonight. Have a good week, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, are you ready to actually get to the to the show now? Uh, I guess. Okay. Sure. That, they we're like 15 <laughs> minutes into the show and we haven't talked about anything entertainment. <laughs> we are entertaining we enough. Are. That we are. that's all people need. We're here all week, folks. Try the veal. Right. <laughs> uh, all right, let's get into it. Sure. Go for Disney Detective. So Disney's Enchanted sequel, Disenchanted, finally wrapped filming in Ireland, and it's going to be coming to Disney Plus in 2022. So the movie is officially on its way. On Wednesday, the director and producer, Adam Shankman, uh, who also did Hairspray, had announced that the sequel to the beloved 2007 movie Enchanted concluded production in Ireland, and it's on uh, the way he had posted myself and Giselle, uh, Amy Adams would like to say that's a wrap. Disenchanted is coming to you in 2022. He wrote on Instagram alongside a photo of himself and Amy Adams, who stars in the movies as Princess Giselle. So the highly anticipated sequel has actually been in development since early 2010, according to the film's IMDb page. And Shankman was confirmed to return as the director in 2016. So the original film had Amy Adams um, character who was about to marry a prince and she was sent away from her animated kingdom of uh, Andalusia. Andalusia and was basically transported into New York City. <clears throat> Excuse me. There she uh, meets and falls in love with a lawyer and befriends his young daughter. So the story is said to take place 15 years after Enchanted as Giselle questions her happy happily ever after and accidentally triggers events that turns everybody's world upside down, both in the real world and in the animated world. Um, so along with Amy Adams, Patrick Dempsey, James Marsden, Adina Menzel and Susan Sarandon will all be reprising their roles in the forthcoming film. Obviously there's some added people that have been added to the cast. One happens to be your, Celebrity crush, bestie, <laughs> Twitter friend, <laughs> Yvette Nicole Brown. That's right, um, baby. So she happens to be in this. And as we had mentioned, today is her. Tomorrow. Oh, tomorrow. tomorrow. I'm sorry. Tomorrow. tomorrow is her birthday. So I didn't miss it. So you didn't miss it. You you posted, you know, a pre-happy birthday message. You even said we'd be talking about it on the podcast. And she liked the and comment. She liked it, yep. So who knows? Maybe she'll actually comment on this. But anyway, so she's going to be. Um, in in the movie as well. So in May, it was announced that Maya Rudolph was also going to be joining the cast um, as a villain in the upcoming musical. So it is set to premiere exclusively on Disney Plus in 2022. So in development since 2010, when did the original one come out? 2007. Wow, really? Yeah. Because I remember we went to see it. We went to see it. Yeah, it was one of our dates. Yeah. Yeah, that was, yeah. So it's been in development for 10 years, 11 years, 11 years. now. That's yeah. incredible. Yeah. Like, I wonder what held it up. Was it, was it plot? Because obviously they got all the key characters back. Right. They were able to get all the characters. You know, I wonder if it was just a matter of, you know, the right script. Well, you figure it, it was in development three years after the original. Which makes sense. So, know? and then it was probably a, what do we want to do with it? And then, you know... The other thing, too, is can you get everybody right. back right. because basically everybody that has been that was in the movie has gone on to do many other things. Right. So it could have been a timing issue, Well, I would have to too. think it's a lot easier to get them back in three years than it is in 11 years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, it, you know, but then again, that also kind of helps to age 
age it out that's too. true because it is supposed to be set 15 years in the future right too. exactly whereas if you you know did Saves it on the visual effects and exactly this way you don't have to yeah. age them. you can age them naturally right. um so uh, i know it was a uh, a, a favorite of mine. It was. It was a really cute um, movie, and the way that they handed it back and forth was really well done. Right, right, because it, it had that, you know, you had the, the fairy tale world that was all animated, and then you had the real world, and, you know, What's not fun, everything. What was really fun about it was to see how they translated the cute fairy animals from the animated yes. world to New York. <laughs> right, exactly. And that was and that was the funny, you know, part of it how some yeah. of the characters, you know, were CGI'd to yeah. to bring them in, you know, some some transformed well when they came over to the human world where, you right. know, some of them some some of them didn't. So And I, I have to say I appreciate uh uh Patrick Dempsey's uh Oh, a sense of humor here with his his singing ability. Right. Because he actually had had uh, in the article said, I will be singing for the first time. I've never sung publicly for a reason. <laughs> so bear with me. I hope the fans embrace it. Uh, they've set me up for success and the lyrics are fun. Yeah, um, that's that's, you know, the self-deprecating humor there. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so should be a should be a cute movie mm-hmm. if they follow the and it's going to be a great movie. Because the vet's going to be in it. Of course. So, you know. We Has gotta, to be. Got to get out to see it. Of course. We don't have to get out. It's well, we gotta Disney get, Plus. Gotta get, <laughs> gotta get out of the studio to see it. Right. We have to go downstairs to the living room right. and watch it. Right. Next year. <laughs> so, another movie that we have news about. Let's talk about that one. Right. So, uh, we had heard news of the Lightyear movie, uh, but now some more information has come out about it. So... Every year since Pixar's inception, Buzz Lightyear has obviously remained a key player in the company's ever-sustaining longevity. He's probably arguably the most recognizable character uh, Pixar has has done with all of the Toy Story tales or the Toy Stories, um, with him being, you know, the space ranger kind of at the forefront of everything. So now it seems... That it's time for the cadet to go to infinity and, of course, beyond. So the famous spaceman will finally have a Pixar movie of his own with Lightyear, the 26th feature film from the multi-award winning Animation House. With Chris Evans lending his voice to the galaxy hoppy Journey Man, the Buzz Lightyear um, we won't be the same buzz that we've all kind of grown up with over the decades, particularly as this variation of the character will follow the origins of the astronaut character who inspired the toy, not Andy's plastic friends. So we're still kind of learning some information about this June uh, 2022 release. Um, so here are some of the key things that we've we've found out. Um so the release date is supposed to be June seventeenth of twenty twenty two. So kind of less than a year from 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 now. Um, and while this past year, year and a half, Disney has been dropping, you know, all of the new Pixar movies to Disney Plus. As of right now, there is supposed to be a theatrical rollout for. This movie. So as of right now, it will not be going to Disney Plus. It will be in the theaters. But again, who knows where we'll be, you know, in less than a year. Um, Chris Evans will voice Buzz Lightyear. So for a lot of people, it's kind of hard to imagine Tim Allen not being the voice of um, Buzz Lightyear. But there have been lots of different actors actually throughout the years who have done the voice of Buzz Lightyear because they had the different cartoon versions of it. But obviously, Tim Allen always did the animated films for it. So this will be a little bit of a change. Um, When it was announced, it was revealed that Chris Evans, not Tim Allen, would lend the voice because it's a totally different kind of character. So what we're going to see is we're going to see the evolution of the astronaut and how he ends up becoming this toy figure. So I'm sure, you know, I could kind of see the end of the movie happening with, you know, the first prototype of it and you get to hear the iconic, um, you know, sayings from, from Tim Allen. Um, 
So again, it's not going to be a movie based on the toy. It's going to be the person behind the toy. So um, kind of a different direction uh, than a lot of people were, were first talking about. And that was, I think, one of the things, too, when they had announced that there was going to be this movie. Everyone's like, you're making a movie about a toy? And then they kind of came out with some more information after that saying, no, it's going to be the inspiration behind it, you know, whereas we we saw from some of the other Toy Story movies, you know, that Woody was a toy. He, you know, was was generated, he he came to be from the, the show. The TV show. The TV yeah. show, and that yeah. was his origin. So now we're going to get to see, you know, that Buzz Lightyear had a very different, um, you know, coming to you know, so, to it. So. so let me get this straight. So Buzz Lightyear is Captain America. Is that the next is that like season two of what if? <laughs> that would be kind of funny. <laughs> and like how many more iconic characters is Chris Evans gonna play? You know, he was human torch, he was Captain right. America, he's Buzz Lightyear. Now he's gonna be Buzz Lightyear. Who's he gonna be next? Superman? Well no, he has to probably go to um like uh Star Wars now. He because could be the new Han Solo. He could be because he looks more like Han Solo <laughs> than the Han Solo that was played in the movie Solo. <laughs> anyway, sorry, I couldn't resist there. Oh, that was funny. I heard he wants to be a pilot too. So, anyway, anyway, so, so June seventeenth, twenty twenty two. Mark it on your calendar now. All right, we're going to take a quick break, <laughs> and we'll be back with our uh, tales from the edge of the galaxy. As soon as I find the right button. <laughs> For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Go for Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. <laughs> so after Disney revealed the very pricey cost for the new Star Wars hotel, it seems that Universal Orlando has an amusing, cheeky response. Besides, you know, everything that we were talking about last Good week. Good for them. So since the advent of social media, brands have found increasingly unique ways to reach out to their customers online. Some interact directly with fans, some harness the power of memes, and some engage in some good-natured trolling of their competitors. And that's exactly what Universal Studios did after Disney revealed the very pricey cost of the new Star Wars hotel. And the company even managed to incorporate a throwback to another golden social media comment. So, the rollout for Disney's Galactic Star Cruiser experience hasn't been as smooth as the company probably would have liked. Um, after it was revealed the pricey packages of the new Star Wars-themed accommodation, the response from fans online hasn't actually been very enthusiastic. <laughs> there was one comment... Myself included. Uh, uh, yourself included. There was one that actually said, do you really think the family that can afford this is really going to disconnect from work for two days because you know, daddy's going to be taking some business call while he's in negotiations, you know, with the trade federation or something. So I thought that was kind of funny. Um, so after it was revealed about the price packages, obviously, like we said, fans online weren't very enthusiastic and the team at Disney probably didn't anticipate that one of the biggest rivals would kind of jump in 
at the chance to get in a dig. And that's exactly what Universal Studios Orlando Resort's official Twitter account did. They said, think how many churros that could you could buy with that kind of money. So it's safe to say that Universal Studios' social media team has mastered the art of subtweet. While the tweet didn't directly refer what was um, reference the griping that was happening on Twitter regarding the Galactic Star Cruiser, the timing and the fact that it came from the resort's account made it clear what the company was referring to. So if you haven't been following Universal Studios tweets recently, the reference to the churros might be a little bit confusing. So what it was actually referencing was a year-old inside joke among fans um, of the park that started when the construction of Islands of Adventure's Velasco uh, Velocicoaster began. So after trolling fans about what was happening in the construction, the construction jo- zone, one came to the conclusion that the park was building a churro stand. So the social media team embraced the churro joke and fans ate it up. And the whole affair had a particularly delicious payoff when the coaster actually opened with a nearby churro stand next door. So That's kind of their ongoing joke, obviously. So unfortunately, Disney's social media admins have had a harder time turning the Galactic Star Cruiser situation into a feel-good moment. However, the company is still in the early stages of rolling out the experience, only there's plenty of time to evolve and help fans get on board. The hotel itself is extravagantly priced, but it still may become an essential part of the Disney experience for Star Wars fans who feel like shelling out $6,000 for two nights. Um, When details about the accommodation began to emerge, it became clear that it's not like a normal hotel and that guests who stay there will have a chance to live out their very own Star Wars story. In that way, it's designed to be like an attraction all on its own and not just a place where fans can crash for the night after a long day at the park. Obviously, we also know that food and lodging are included with the package, so that it might be worth it for diehard fans, but there's obviously no churros on the menu. But as we've talked about, it's still pricey for even the most diehard fan. You know, I think there was another thing that that said um, that they want you and McGregor there to teach them the ways of the force if I'm paying that much. (laughs) And I have a theory here. I think Disney's going to cave to the pressure here and come up with a solution. And when you look at the solutions they've come up in the past, like, for instance, long lines. Mm -hmm. So when Disney runs into problems with long lines, they traditionally attack it by making the lines an attraction. Mm -hmm. So they don't shorten the lines. So I don't see Disney cheapening these prices at all. What I see Disney doing is offering financing for this now. (laughs) So now you'll be able to finance your uh, Your galactic boondoggle excursion. (laughs) So you don't have to pay it all off in one time. So not only are you going to pay $6,000, you're probably going to be paying 5.5% interest to Disney if you do that too. So – that's literally what I see them doing here okay, is giving you a finance I could see option. That. I, could, I could see that, I guess. But kudos to Universal for, for getting into the spirit of things and, and really having their finger on the pulse of what, oh, absolutely. what the fans are They're, looking at. I can honestly say, and it's funny because everybody knows – we're huge Disney fans. Everybody knows you're the, you know, one of the ultimate Star Wars fans. And there are, and whenever anything Disney pops up or Haunted Mansion pops up or Star Wars pops up, usually I have somebody tagging me on something or posting like, right. hey, did you see this? When are you guys going? Da, 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 da. Not one person has said anything about, so did you book your tickets for Galactic Star Cruiser yet? Yep. Not a one has said anything. That I just haven't, means they all watch the podcast. Right. <laughs> Not one person that I follow, and I follow, you know, probably almost half, you know, a fourth of the people that I follow are all Disney friends on Facebook and Instagram. Not one person that I follow has mentioned anything like, hey, I'm saving my pennies now. I can't wait to be one of the first. 
Well, and to be honest with you, we're not the people that Disney put this up for. Absolutely. They put this up for the one percenters. Mm -hmm. And that's what they're charging for. Right. And, and that's who they're going to get. And that was actually the one article that I saw, I guess it was maybe a couple of days ago, was um, one of the Disney fan sites where basically they said, we're going to show you the equivalent. And it was, you know, taking into account the Grand Floridian a two night stay at the most expensive mm -hmm. room yeah. and okay. So food's included. So let's make a reservation at this exclusive restaurant and okay. G you know, one, one park ticket and they did screenshots from Disney.com, you know, Disneyworld.com just to compare. And it still didn't even come up to right. close to being, you know, how much they were yeah. doing for this. So yeah. Anyway, on to bigger and better news in Star Wars. <laughs> so it seems the Ahsoka series has been uh, one of the biggest sources of speculation since it was announced last December. So the character made her live action debut in late November of 2020, uh, who was played by Rosario Dawson in the fifth episode of The Mandalorian's second season. So many fans assumed uh, that this would be the place where more characters from Star Wars Rebels would start to make the jump to live action. And rumors from these past six months have run in that direction, too. So now it seems The Hollywood Reporter is stating that Lucasfilms is looking for an actress to play Sabine Wren, the Mandalorian from the animated, sh uh, the animated show. So indeed, hidden in the article by The Hollywood Reporter about the... Uh, newly released What If series from Marvel Studios, writer Aaron uh, Couch had said um, that Lucasfilms uh, is saying that a Lucasfilm source, I'm sorry, um, is saying that this is the case. In particular, he had said now Dawson is leading a live action Ahsoka spinoff for Disney Plus with sources saying that Lucasfilms is looking for an act actress to star opposite her as Mandalorian warrior Sabine Wren. So this means that now we can take a look, um, you know, take it to the bank where she is definitely going to be jumping from the animated series into the live action one. Um, so obviously the article, you know, didn't really go into it, but pretty much know that's what they're talking about. Um, so now it, um, they were mentioning that the one actress who played her uh, in the original show, she was actually a live action actress, but she did the voice. So is it something where maybe they would bring her in or would they bring somebody else? Um, you know, obviously you have uh, somebody uh, with, uh, Bo Katan, um, Katie Sackoff, who did the voice in the animated version, and they were able to bring her on. So, do you kind of do that, or do you bring somebody else? Obviously, we're not really sure yet because it, it, you know, it's just sort of new. I guess you know they haven't started doing anything yet. But obviously, the next chapter from the Mandalorian pocket of the universe will come to us this December in the form of the Book of Boba Fett, which is basically being kind of called season 2.5 of the Mandalorian. So obviously more news will probably be coming out uh, as this develops and we'll probably be talking about it, I'm sure. And I, I really don't have anybody that I would say would be a good fit for it. The the actress who played the voice uh, of Sabine Wren, uh, Tia Sarkar, she is a striking resemblance of the character. So mm -hmm. it would if she's available... Mm -hmm. It would make a lot of sense to have her come in and fill that role. Right. Um, but it would also be interesting to see how that's going to tie into the Mandalorian because she plays a very pivotal part in the history of where we leave off with Mandalore, the planet Mandalore and the government there and her mother and stuff like that. So there's a lot of story that can go in that direction by bringing that character in. So very, very exciting, very interesting. It's definitely good to see them bring these animated characters mm -hmm. into the real world for yeah, us yeah. Um, to really latch on to. So that was all we had for our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. We'll be right back with our Entertainment News of the Week. In 
Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com on the web at insightsintothings.com. Go for entertainment news. So this was news that kind of made me happy because I obviously was a huge fan of Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist. And just a few months ago... They had canceled it after its second season. So now it seems that it might get one more chapter after all, thanks to an unexpected venue. So Lionsgate Television, the lead studio behind the unique series, is reportedly close to a deal with Roku to develop a holiday movie for its own streaming channel. So NBC had canceled the show after two seasons in June and attempted to move the show to NBC Universal's Peacock Network, and that was unsuccessful. So the Roku movie would bring back the entire cast, including Jane Levy, who played Zoe Clark. The deal is still being finalized, but if the movie is successful, Roku might consider ordering another season of the series, sources told this outlet. Lionsgate's efforts to keep the show alive were extensive, but nothing came as close to fruition as this unique Roku plan. Uh, while Lionsgate's search was on, the cast's contract uh, options expired at the end of June. Uh, this was thought to be the final nail in the coffin for the show, but however, after Lionsgate started talks with Roku, the studio reached out to the main cast and is now close to finalizing deals with them for a holiday-themed movie. While Roku is best known for its streaming hardware, the company has started making strides to beep beef up content on its own Roku streaming channel because, you know, everybody has their own streaming channel now. So the biggest content acquisition so far has actually been the Quibi library, <laughs> oh, which, yeah, bringing all of the content created by the failed mobile short form streaming uh, experiment to the Roku channel. So the company recently reported that it's had 55.1 million active accounts jumping one from 1.5 from the first quarter of 2021. So uh, Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist um, basically centered around Zoe Clark, who was a San Francisco-based software engineer who can understand people's feelings through their heart songs that only she can hear. Um, the rest of the cast is uh, had Skylar uh, Aston, Alex Newell, uh, John Clarence Stewart, uh, Mary Steenburgen, um, who, you know, made uh, the, who rounded out the cast. So the show's second season ended with a surprising cliffhanger, which made its cancellation in June even more heartbreaking. So though the show never earned huge ratings, it did build a dedicated fan base. Um, the choreographer of the show actually won it. Emmy for Outstanding uh, Choreography for a Scripted Program. Uh, she also um, uh, got two other nominations for season two. Uh, it was also nominated for Outstanding Original Music and Lyrics. Um, and Bernadette Peters uh, earned an Outstanding Guest Actress in a Comedy Series nomination. Um, so both of the seasons are available to stream on Peacock. And if this comes to light, it'll kind of be a nice way to kind of send off the series. You kind of get some sort of finality 
you know, to it, which I always like when they're able to to kind of do that. So, so should I watch this so we can guarantee that it never comes back again <laughs> after this? I know it's not coming back. So. <laughs> well, you never know if they said that. If it, well, if that's the, true. If, the, if they get enough people on, if they get enough people on who are interested, then you know they could bring back another season of it. Maybe I unless I, I watch it, of course. Right. So yeah, don't wait back. till the holiday season, and then we'll see. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. But thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> Let's talk Wizard World. Yeah. So this was news. I think it came out today, I believe. So Wizard World just sold its conventions to Fan Expo. So fans generally think about pop culture conventions as being tied to a specific city, like San Diego, Chicago, New York, etc. But those conventions are usually run by larger companies. And now... After its latest acquisition, one company in particular has become the biggest of all. Fan Expo, which already runs almost a dozen events across North America, has just acquired the rights to six Wizard World conventions. Chicago, Philadelphia, New Orleans, Portland, Cleveland, and St. Louis. So according to Newsarama, this makes it now the largest... comic convention organization across the globe. So Fan Expo HQ is devoted to creating unmissable, exceptional fan experiences. We're beyond thrilled to be able to offer that to fans in six new locations and pleased that Wizard World recognized our ability to um, elevate guest experiences to the next level. This was a statement that came out from the Fan Expo HQ president. Um, they also said, we're looking forward to getting to know each of these individual communities, learning what they are looking for and raising the bar. So it's certainly a huge shift in the convention scene as Wizard World, as the Wizard World brand, technically now Wizard Entertainment Incorporated, has been around for what feels like ages. It was originally established back in 1991 as Wizard Press and was the publisher of the famous Wizard magazine. It was basically the source to find out about comic books and other nerdy news before the internet took over and later went to establish a fan base of uh, conventions and more. But as the beat points out, things weren't always smooth for the company. The changes are already live on the Fan Expo website for the undated 2022 conventions in those cities. One last Wizard World taking place in Chicago in October will still occur. And however, after that, Wizard World will no longer have any stake in the convention circuit. The company will continue to run a collectibles business and have space at the conventions. For fans, it's safe to assume this deal doesn't change much for them. Most comic conventions are pretty much the same. Lots of people, lots of booths, lots of Funko Pops. Um, Only now the name on all the badges, on the banners is going to be different. And, you know, the money that you pay is obviously going to another company now. So like so many other businesses, the entertainment convention industry as a whole obviously took a huge dent during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Even the biggest comic convention in the world, San Diego Comic Con, which is run by a nonprofit organization that also runs WonderCon, admitted the lack of live events during 2020 put a huge burden on the company's finances. You'd imagine that's the case with most companies who rely on live events, so maybe a sale like this isn't so much of a surprise. The surprise would be if it's the last one. And you know what? If this is what keeps the conventions going, I'm all for it. Right. Uh, we've had mixed experiences going to Wizard Wizards. World. Mm-hmm. The early days that we were going, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, they were very different, run very differently. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We had a really rough period about seven, eight years ago. Right. And we actually stopped going. And we because... stopped going because we had so because we wound up. We had such a good time the first couple of years we went that we wound up going with the VIP package. And it was the just one year. a terrible experience. It was a waste of money. Mm-hmm. It was poorly run. Mm-hmm. It was disorganized. So the consistency in which Wizard, because they would bring in different um, local groups to to run events. Right. You know, different 
management groups and stuff. Right. Like it wasn't the same group that went from city to city. Exactly. Exactly. So mm -hmm. you had a very inconsistent experience year over year. Right. So maybe having this in the hands of a group that their sole purpose is that they run conventions might lend itself to that consistency and and give us that experience that we're looking for. As and fans. this might be why the venue changed, you know, because we noticed when they finally announced the dates for Wizard Philadelphia, it was a totally different location. Possible. So yeah. I'm guessing, you but know. this transaction just happened, so I highly doubt it was I don't contingent know. upon that. I don't know, because things don't just happen. Well, because Chicago is already scheduling and going on, and that's still a wizard production. Right, but that's the thing is that's the last, you know. The, I think the one thing that we're, we're failing to take into consideration here is that this Wizard World event that they're having is not happening at the same time, and it was happening right. unscheduled right. off the regular schedule. Right. So it's entirely possible they either didn't want to deal with the restrictions that were going on at the convention Maybe. center because Philly's under different restrictions than the uh, Greater Expo Center is because Greater Expo is not under City of Philly regulations. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but that that's the whole thing is the timing of, you know, because, again, right. a deal just doesn't, Happen. Right, it's but just, we've, you've seen that you can throw something together pretty quickly oh. at the Greater Expo Center. That's exactly what Monster Mania true, did. True, So yeah. maybe if they decided things are – restrictions are easing and we want to have something, well, Philadelphia Convention Center is not available. We maybe. can't book it on the budget we have right now. <coughs> Let's book Greater Philadelphia. We know we can get in there and then true, we'll do the maybe. best we can. Yeah, who knows? So, but we'll see. Hopefully, hopefully under new management it's going to be – a return to what we, we enjoyed before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I just wanted to come back, period. Right. I want conventions to return. Yeah. So that was all we had for our entertainment news this week. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll be right back with our insightful picks of the week. Go for your insightful pick. So my insightful pick actually is a CNN original series called The History of the Sitcom. So the history of the sitcom reunites audiences with the television friends, families, and co-workers they grew up with while introducing um, cutting-edge comedies that are sure to be on your next binge-watching uh, list. The eight-part docuseries features over 180 original interviews with sitcom sitcom icons including Norman Lear, Tina Fey, Tracy Morgan, Lisa Kudrow, Jason Alexander, Kelsey Grammer, Kim Fields, Tim Allen, Carl, Carl Reiner, Dick Van Dyke, George Lopez, Mel Brooks, and a whole lot more. Um, and it, they basically break down how sitcoms have helped generations of Americans navigate an ever-shifting landscape. And what's interesting is that they kind of break it up into different subcategories. So the one talk is um, family matter. So it talks about all the different family dynamics of how the sitcom, you know, throughout the years ha has developed. Um, then they talk about sex in the sitcom and how, you know, certain things you couldn't talk about in the seventies that now you can talk about and, you know, kind of make fun of or laugh about it um, and how it's easier to talk about. Um, then there was an episode, uh, Just Friends and all the different um, sitcoms that, that went around that. Um, then the Working for Laughs, so all the different uh, ones that related around a workplace environment. Um, then the Freaks, Geeks, and Outsiders uh, version. And finally, the last one was Escaping Reality. Um, so each episode uh, is, um, I think they still have one more. So they've only shown uh, seven out of the eight right now, but they are all available on the uh, CNN app if you have that. Okay, cool pick. Thank you. So my pick this week is a, another uh, You're pilfering welcome. of, of <laughs> yours. Uh, technically, you hadn't watched before me. It was one that you wanted to watch, and we watched it together uh, mm -hmm. last night. And it's called Shadow and Bone on Netflix. Shadow and Bone is a fantasy television series for Netflix that premiered on April 21st. 
it's uh, based on a two book, uh, two series of books in the what they call the Grisha verse created by American author Leigh Bardugo. Uh, her trilogy, the first of which is Shadow and Bone, and the duology that begins with Six of Crows. All eight episodes of the first season premiered on April 21st, adapting Shadow and Bone and an original storyline featuring the Crows. Uh, in June 2021, the series was renewed for a second season, also consisting of eight episodes, adapting Siege and Storm and another original storyline featuring the Crows. So the Grisha are people who can practice what they call the, quote, small science. Rafka is one of few places they can live safely. Uh, there are there there they are trained for the second army and divided into three orders: the ethereal kai summon natural elements like wind or fire; the material kai summon uh, or control materials such as metal and glass; and the corporeal kai manipulate people's bodies. Ravka's second army is led by General Kirigan who has spent his life searching for a Grisha who can summon light, the only person who could destroy the shadow fold, a region of impenetrable darkness created hundreds of years ago. Since then, Rafka has been at war and is now on the brink of splitting in two as the West seeks independence. Alina Starkov turns out to be such a Grisha, and word spreads that a sun summoner has been found. In the trade city of Ketterdam, Kaz Brecker is hired to kidnap her. Fjordan, witch hunters, are sent to kill her, and the people of Ravka venerate her as a saint. Don't know which way to turn in that place. <laughs> Alina must come to terms with who she is and decide who she can truly trust as she searches for the power that will allow her to destroy the fold and save Ravka. So, the imagery and iconography... Uh, initially strikes me as a mix of Carnival Row and Avatar The Last Airbender. It has kind of a Victorian steampunk feel to it with a mix of mystical magic. So far, um, uh, we're only one episode in, but I'm compelled to continue to watch it more. The storytelling at first is kind of disjointed and unorganized, hopping between time periods and individual backstories. But at the end of the first episode, they do bring all of that confusion together in a compelling, if still unclear, story. Not having read any of the books in the series, I come into the show completely unaware of the world at large. As a result, I struggle at some times with the dialogue, not knowing if they're talking about a person, a place, or an organization. The immediate feel from episode one is that the story is set in a very rich and diverse world. Think a Tolkien-type world mm -hmm. where there's a yeah. huge history to it. Mm -hmm. uh, the story is presented in such uh, a way as to make me want to explore it more, so there's a good chance I might actually pick up the books and read about it. I was impressed with the first episode, and I'm in it for a few more at this point. I don't like to commit to full seasons because I hate getting disappointed in the middle of a season. I was pleased to see it was picked up for a second season, which might mean it's here to stay for a while at least. And I haven't canceled this show yet because I hadn't started watching it yet. <laughs> That's always a good thing when you when you go to Netflix and it says season two is yeah. coming. And you're like, oh, good. Now I can I can at least be invested. In yep. this. <laughs> so Shadow and Bone on Netflix. You're we'll welcome. Be, <laughs> thank you. We'll be right back. <laughs> So what else did we have? We have some afterthoughts that we're, we're hammering home for people. Sure. So this weekend in Cherry Hill is Monster Mania 46. Uh, if you're not in the Cherry Hill area or not uh, interested in going to that one, then in September in Hunt Valley, Maryland is Monster Mania 47. And then October 22nd to the 24th is Monster Mania 48 in Oaks, Pennsylvania. Then, of course, we have the Carnival Collections free toy show, which will be September 11th. And that's a, a really little toy show. Again, you know, maybe 10 tables, 
but the venue is one of those that's kind of interesting and very unique to to walk around and and look at as well. Um, part of the toy show from the the organization that does that one, they do the Delaware Train Show and the Oktoberfest Toy Show, which is the uh, I guess probably the first weekend, maybe second weekend in October, October 9th and October tenth, and that's in Newcastle, Delaware, at the Nur Shrine Center. So again, it's the Delaware Train Show on Saturday. And then the October, uh, the Oktoberfest toy show on Sunday. Um, then, of course, we have RetroCon, which is going to be in uh, September, the end of September, September 25th and 26th at the Greater Philadelphia Expo Center. And why is it greater? Because they said so. Right. Um, and then if you just kind of, you know, stay over the weekend or for the week, uh, right after that is BrickFest, which is October uh, 2nd and 3rd. Again, a cute um, uh, a um, Lego-based Lego uh, fest. So if you're into seeing some grand creations, you know, from the smallest thing to big life-size things, this is definitely uh, the convention for you. Okay, that's it? That's it, because you didn't move anything up yet. Well, because we, we still have, <laughs> We still we got some time. We talked about it, right? So the next one we're going to be moving up is... Is, Wizard, is World. Wizard World. So Wizards, as we mentioned, isn't going to be called Wizards, I'm guessing. I don't know. They're still publishing it as Wizards. Are they still publishing yeah, it? I went to so, so that convention that's change. normally. <laughs> so I didn't want to move it up because I didn't know if they're changing Right. We the don't name. know what it's called, but Wizards, Fan Expo, Philly, whatever. Something else at the Greater Philadelphia Expo. Is going to be November, uh, yeah, November 12th, 13th, and 14th at <coughs> excuse me, the Greater Philadelphia Expo Center. But we'll talk about that when we have more details. Exactly. We're still a ways out from mm-hmm. that. That's it. Uh, another one in the books? Yeah. And uh, we're going to plug the show at the end here? I don't no? know. Are you? All it's right. up to you. I don't know. We kind of milked that. All right. You know what? Uh, subscribe to the podcast. You can get audio versions of the podcast. This is Insights in Entertainment. Video versions of the podcast, you can subscribe to Insights into Things. We're on Apple, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio. Uh, also, reach out to us. Give us your feedback. Give us some conventions in your neck of the woods that we can talk about. Uh, we'd love to plug them. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can find us on Twitter at insights underscore things. On Facebook, we're at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. On Instagram at instagram.com backslash insights into things. Audio versions of this podcast can be found on the web at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com. You can find the video versions of our podcast at youtube.com backslash insights into things. And we do stream five days a week, we'll say, sometimes six when we do the monthly podcast. <laughs> but we're, we stream on <coughs> twitch.tv slash insights into things. I'm not going to beg for a okay. subscription. And uh, if you missed out on all of those links and you just want to go to our main site, find our little bios with our cute little animated pictures, you can go to insightsintothings.com. That's it. Another one in the books. Have a good week, everyone. Bye. Bye.